Welcome to Talk Dizzy to Me, the show that brings you a comprehensive look into the complex field of dizziness. Now here are your hosts, vestibular physical therapist, Dr. Abby Ross and Dr. Danielle Tolman. Welcome back to another episode of Talk Dizzy to Me. My name is Dr. Danielle Tolman. I'm a vestibular physical therapist and as always joined by my co-host, Dr. Abby Ross, a vestibular physical therapist and neuroclinical specialist. And today we are so excited to have some special guests with us to talk about vision dysfunction and vestibular dysfunction. We have Dr. Debbie Feinberg, who is an optometrist, and Dr. Mark Rosner, who is an ophthalmologist emergency physician. They are co-founders and co-directors of the Neurovisual Medicine Institute in Michigan, which trained other optometrists to become neurovisual specialists. Welcome, guys. I'm so excited that you're here. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you for joining us. If you wouldn't mind, maybe give us um, uh, our listeners a little bit more of a background about you guys, what got you into this field and kind of what you what you do? Sure. So I graduated from uh, Illinois College of Optometry in 1983. And not too long after graduating, I began to work with patients sent to me by an ear, nose and throat doctor uh, who happened to have been my brother-in-law. So the interesting twist is he was my first index patient who was clumsy, klutzy, disoriented in space and struggled with reading. So he was my first prison patient, and that began my journey into really learning about how to help a dizzy patient. It wasn't something I learned in school, but it became something I learned over time with caring for these patients. So that's my beginning. And mine is, I'm an emergency physician. I retired a few years ago from that. I've been working with Debbie probably since 2000 now um, in one capacity or another with regards to her practice, as well as to the academic underpinnings of this new optometric specialty we've created called neurovisual medicine. And it basically involves the correlation between the eyes and the vestibular system and alignment issues and how when things don't function quite properly, you can end up with the entire panoply of vestibular symptoms, dizziness, balance, et cetera, as well as headaches and a few other things. So um, we have worked academically to put some legs on this because otherwise, you know, without the uh, background on it, it's just kind of like just your thoughts. So we have published academically. Um, we have a tool that we uh, validated for screening, which we'll talk more about. And that's kind of where we're starting from. And uh, it's been mentioned that uh, Dr. Mark is an ophthalmologist. He's actually an emergency physician. Uh, he's working in the realm with me. Uh, so it's thought MD ophthalmology, but he's actually an emergency physician. I like it. I like, and which I'm sure you see a lot of dizziness in the emergency room because a lot of people think they're dying and they, they think that the world is coming to an end and they end up in the ER because they have no idea what's going on with them. So I'm sure you've seen a good fair share of that, which has kind of pushed you in that direction. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really yeah. excited to dive into everything that we are planning to talk about today. Um, why don't we start with the relationship between the vision, vestibular system, and the nervous system. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about that? And if you could just maybe describe what you guys see as practitioners um, in that field. Well, in our work on a daily basis, we are very symptom driven. We're always listening to what are the top symptoms that our patients have. So for example, dizziness, nausea, headache, anxiety, imbalance with walking and light sensitivity. We've now added sound sensitivity. So in our patients, we are always starting with the premise of, tell me about your symptoms. And we do use this vision questionnaire that sort of assorts them, but we're looking to see, are they a candidate for care? When I was in school as an optometrist, our primary focus was, can you see near, can you see far? blur and so on, that was the limit. So working in this new specialty, we're really becoming what we call neurovisual specialists, looking at those neurological symptoms that are actually potentially vision-based. Just to I add, love just oh, to add oh, on, Mark. Sorry. Um, yeah, and Debbie was fond of telling me that they never taught her about dizziness in optometry school. So the concept that an optometrist could actually address dizziness or vestibular symptoms was a foreign concept. Um, so really where we've been going is kind of new territory. I have to say that it's so refreshing to hear you 
mentioned that the history, the how the patient is feeling is so important to you because that's echoed in our field too, but that's not echoed across the spectrum of, of medicine and healthcare. I love when a patient walks out of the office and feels heard, and it sounds like that's exactly what you both do. So awesome there. Now, when you are, after you hear the, the symptoms that the patient is describing to you, what kind of screening tools do you use to know if your profession and discipline is appropriate? So prior to them even coming to the office, we have them fill out what's called a binocular vision dysfunction questionnaire. 25 questions that sorts them in multiple domains, the pain, headache domain, the dizzy domain, anxiety domain, light sensitivity, vision uh, symptoms. So once they fill that out, we have a scoring mechanism. Anything higher than 15 is considered significant for their likely being a visual piece to the puzzle. They fill that out. That tells us they're a candidate. Uh, then we also talk about something called the five-minute cover test. So that means that we've learned that this is a two-eyed problem. So when the eyes are not working together, that's when people feel many of these neurological symptoms. So we developed a test called the five-minute cover test. So by identifying which is the eye of interest or the high eye, we have them sit for five minutes, looking at a blank wall, eight feet away, relax, and we get a before and after. We get their symptoms before, and at the end of the five minutes, we have them track their afters. And very often we see a third to a half reduction just by getting rid of the fighting eye. Hmm. So when these two eyes are working against each other, all the symptoms come up. And as we quiet down the fighting, we begin to see a calming of the symptoms. That tells us this is a two-eyed problem. We're likely to have them be a good candidate for care. The third thing that our clinicians can learn about besides those two tests is something called the near point of what used to be called convergence. We call it the near point of discomfort. So as you have them follow an object towards their nose, have them stop the stick or the object of regard when they start to feel nauseous or dizzy, lightheaded, or feel uncomfortable, they'll close their eyes. That number of inches from their eyes should be four inches. But if they're out here somewhere at eight inches feeling dizzy, then that tells you there may be, again, a two-eyed vision problem at hand. I really like uh, I really like that last test. That's a great way of kind of putting a different terminology on it, but looking at the test in a different way rather than convergence. Um, you know, I think convergence, we look for that objective um, eye movement or for the patient to say it blurs. But to look at the symptoms and put it back more on the patient of when they're being symptomatic, I think is definitely more indicative of what's going on and what's driving their symptoms. So that's a really, a really great point and a different look at that test that I think I'm definitely going to utilize moving forward with, with patients. Now, when you do measure for that test, do you measure from the eye, from the bridge of the nose? From the, where do you measure from? From their eye to the object of regard. Okay. All right. Yeah. I like that. Um, it, it's so interesting to, to hear about the screening because it's all three screens require no equipment, um, not a lot of training. The one thing that I like about the um, binocular vision dysfunction questionnaire is that you have this available online for patients to screen themselves online, which then leads them directly to a provider directory of specialists who look at this type of dysfunction to get them help. Where can they find that? And I'll make sure we put everything in our show notes um, where they can find these links, but where can they find that questionnaire? So online, if they just put in the URL, is it my eyes.com, up will pop the questionnaire. They fill it out. They put in their city and state and they press send. And then it will go out to a colleague. We have 30 around the country who are doing this work. And then that colleague will then call them back and discuss the results of their questionnaire with them to tell them if they are, in fact, a candidate for evaluation. So cool. And we as physical therapists or vestibular physical therapists can also utilize this in our practice. We have the capacity to do the five-minute cover test. We have the capacity to do the point of discomfort test for convergence. And we can obviously send our patients to the website or give them the questionnaire and then lead them to the directory as well. So this is a great tool for clinicians across all platforms treating vestibular dysfunction and 
you know, we ask ourselves too, is it their eyes? So this is great for us. Now, when we, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to mention that uh, it might be helpful to have your clients put your name in the comment section, how they heard about it. Because what ultimately can happen is when they come for the evaluation, we love to send out letters. So you as a clinician will get a letter when this patient is actually seen, and then you'll get that feedback loop of how did they do and what were their symptoms and were they a candidate and so on. And the other thing I was going to say is that we're more than happy to provide you with um, hard copy like PDFs of these various documents. So maybe you can put those in the notes for this particular section and they can be downloadable. That and the five minute cover test, we have instructions in, on paper as well. Absolutely. Increasing any amount of resources for people listening is basically our main goal for this podcast and, and why I'm so excited to have you on today because it, this your approach is so uh, encapsulating of the multidisciplinary approach that we, you know, Abby and I and a lot of other clinicians preach is it's so important to keep everybody in the loop because the more eyes that we have on a patient and their case, the more likely they are to get the help that they need and get diagnosed and feel better sooner. So that's amazing. And, and you know, we, we look at um, near point discomfort and convergence and stuff, but we are not, it's not in our realm to look at vision um, by any means. You know, I, I found that out um, after observing with the neurovisual specialist in Bethesda, Maryland, and blew my mind how much I had no idea about what they do with their patients with prisms and exercises. And I became a true believer of making sure I had somebody on that, that realm of the team um, in my referral network. So it's, it's super important that people realize that um, patients might complain of visual discomfort, or they might have a plateau in their, in their um, treatment care that going to a neurovisual specialist might be the next thing that gets them over that hump or gets them less symptomatic. So it's just more helpful for your patients and another tool to put in your toolbox as a clinician to have something like this. And those screenings take minutes, if anything, um, they don't require equipment. It's definitely something that people need to know about and utilize. Um, what and are some, what are some before, before you go on real quickly, yeah. um, just want to disabuse one thought. You can have a binocular vision problem and you do not have to have double vision. So as you know, if somebody has double vision or blurred or shadowed vision or imagery, one thinks that they may be diplopic, they need to go see somebody that's visual. I agree with that. But it turns out in our patient cohort, only about a third of our patients admit to that. So fully two thirds of our patients do not have the number one gold standard screening question that everybody uses in order to determine whether somebody needs to see a vision specialist. So it's important to ask your patients whether they're diplopic one way or the other, but if they say no, they still may have a binocular vision issue that's causing their vestibular type symptoms. So don't, just because they don't say they've got double vision, that's not a reason not to consider this. No, we, oh, um, go ahead, Abby. I was just gonna say, um, you know, I, you might agree, but I think I, we have a lot of patients that say they just feel fatigued or their eyes feel off or they feel wobbly. Uh, what else were you gonna say, Abby? I was going to ask, what types of phrases do you often hear from patients when they're describing not only their symptoms, but what they have difficulty doing function-wise? Well, you know, at this time through the pandemic, so many people were required to be screen-based for their entire workday. So I would say many of them talk about how they just are limited in how much time they can spend viewing the letters on the screen. Sometimes they talk about the letters moving on the screen. Sometimes they talk about having to just close an eye. Sometimes they just get into this habit of getting rid of the eye with their hand. Um, they get nauseous when they're scrolling on the screen. Um, they lose their place on the, the you know, reading area, the, they're skipping lines, they're rereading for comprehension. Um, many of these patients separate from the screen can't drive in a car without getting motion sick, especially on curvy roads or on hilly roads or on highways. They, the highest Google search right now to our office is anxiety on fast roads. And it's that flicker frequency in their peripheral vision that just throws them off. So they often say they know all the back roads. They don't do any of the fast ones because they often have to pull off the road. They feel like having a panic attack. Sometimes they end up in the ER and everybody's thinking it's anxiety. Well, it is, but it's related to that visual disorientation that make them feel like they're going to 
you know, go off the road and get in an accident. And also they're, and this is for kind of the PT world, they're clumsy, they're klutzy, they're uncoordinated. I don't know what the technical PT term is for that, but they are. They're the ones that could never catch a baseball. They can't hit a baseball. If they are an outfield and they try and catch a baseball, it's going to hit their forehead because they're not, they don't have good depth perception. Um, so there's things like that. They're, and as kids, they know who they are. Uh, they're also the ones that have reading and learning challenges. Um, so other presentations for this. When we think about patients with binocular vision dysfunction, what are we thinking in terms of causes for this? So we always talk about the two primary causes. One is it's congenital. They were born with it. And they're born with this sort of like motion, early motion sick history. They never, even in a car seat, some of these kids would get motion sick or they never liked to ride in the back seat. Or like Dr. Mark just said, they're clumsy, klutzy. So that's the congenital version or early age they didn't like school. They hated to read. They could learn auditorily, but don't make them read a book. So that's the congenital version. And sometimes it gets worse in fourth grade when the prints get smaller in the books and they're struggling. Uh, that's the congenital. Then the other is usually it's through some kind of injury to the head. It can be a concussion. It can be an acquired brain injury. It can be a traumatic brain injury. It can be from stroke. It can be from, you know, anoxia, a lack of oxygen, let's say, with a near drowning experience. So there's many entry points, but the primary ones we think of are congenital and head injury. And just to uh, put on that a little bit, the congenital, it, facial asymmetry is a huge component of this. Um, so from a physiology point of view, um, Interestingly enough, and you probably know this, nobody is really facially symmetric. Uh, and if you take that uh, thought a little bit further out, one eye and orbit must be higher than the other eye in orbit. But you'll find this interesting. Um, all the vision um, physiologists, when they talk about theory of vertical eye alignment, assume, dangerous word, that both eyes are on the same horizontal plane. They do not acknowledge the concept that one, image, one eye is higher than the other. So this causes a whole raft of issues. And as you're young, you may or may not be able to adapt. So we talk about convergence on the horizontal plane, right? Your eyes converge. Well, there's also vertical convergence we're discussing right now because one eye's higher than the other. And if you're gonna make it a single image, your eyes are gonna have to converge together to do that. Um, the congenital cases usually, they're not traumatic and they have, it's this asymmetry and they're not compensating well for it for whatever reason. And they can do this to align the images. And that head tilt is a driving force for the neck pain and the disorientation space because they feel just off in general. So when we correct them with prism in the glasses, their head straightens up and they no longer have that tilt of their head. So, you know, some parents might think it might be torticollis and it might be an early onset of something that they can't explain. Why is my child tilting their head? So it just gives some insight into what people describe. And, and to put this all in perspective, pretty much patients are experiencing symptoms because they're attempting to avoid seeing double. So there's an original pathology, either the orbital misalignment or a brain injury that then goes ahead and knocks alignment out. But all the symptoms come from struggling like crazy not to be diplopic. Now, could this be applied to, so, you know, a lot of times Abby and I will see an older patient population um, where we do see, you know, traumatic brain injury, but also migraine and stroke. So would that be applicable as well with having an ocular uh, malalignment or misalignment? Sure. Stroke for sure. We see that all the time, um, you know, all kinds of pretty significant misalignments following stroke with field loss and other things. But I think the interesting piece is uh, a population who gets cataract surgery. So unbeknownst to anybody, they just, you know, have their cataracts done, but there may be a slight misalignment of where those implants went in or how they maybe have been compensating prior to cataract surgery. Because as the lens gets cloudy, they're seeing less defin definition. But then also you make everything really clear, but really off alignment. So that can happen after cataract surgery. It can happen after eyelid tightening surgery. You pull on those eyelids and all of a sudden you create a misalignment of the images. We've seen that also. 
even LASIK. I've had patients have LASIK and again, they were compensating well, but all of a sudden you make it so clear far away, but the nearer world is a little off and that's when they get really dizzy and nauseous and the ophthalmologist might send them right off to the ENT, but in fact, it started right after the surgery. So those are just interesting tidbits. And last one is sometimes they're correcting them one eye for far and one eye for near, and that's a recipe for disaster. So our eyes were never meant to be in different planes like that, and you start to do that, and those patients can really travel down a dizzy road uh, with nobody understanding the origin. So one other thing you mentioned a moment ago was migraines, and that kind of opens up a different concept. First of all, you know, is it really a migraine? You know, that's almost the same thing as it, is it really any of these other diagnoses that we're talking about? And I think you have to stay open-minded as to potential etiologies. But, you know, there is such a thing as true migraines, and this condition can precipitate true migraine headache. But, you know, the word migraine has been colloquialized such that, oh, yeah, I got my migraine. I'm going to go take two aspirin. And, you know, that's what we used to call a headache. But, yeah, there's a number of these conditions. And I think the most important thing your clinicians can do, you know, that we can achieve with this presentation today is to get them to stop in their usual pathways of saying, oh, well, they've got headaches. They have to see the neurologist. So take a step back and say, why do you have headaches? Or what triggers your headaches? It's my favorite expression. What's the trigger? Oh, I'm on the computer. Oh, I'm driving on the highway. Those are important elements to say what precipitated that headache. Yeah, I mean, thinking back, uh, there's a lot of patients I, I can kind of relate to a lot of the things that you're saying now that had recent cataract surgery or had, you know, different eye, different types of eye surgery, uh, different types of headache triggers, you know, it's making me kind of go back and rethink some of my patients a little bit, um, which is interesting, which is a very good point to bring up. Well, you know, this impacts 20% of the general population, people just walking around, quote unquote, normal. Um, your population probably has a higher percentage just because they're there because they've got vestibular issues. So with that in mind, I think this really needs to be high on your level uh, of thinking and in your differential. And fortunately, it's only a 25 question questionnaire, right, to try and sort this out. Absolutely. I mean, this is definitely something I think I want to incorporate more in my uh, clinical experience with patients, because I think this is definitely something that's overlooked and it's not something that's often talked about. So I'm excited that we're, we're covering this today. Um, would you be able to walk us through what a typical neurovisual evaluation looks like in your office by the time a patient fills out the screening tools and comes in to see you? What does this look like? So we have traditional screening tests like most offices where we'll do the glaucoma check and we'll look at the retina with the camera and we'll do visual field testing to make sure the visual field's open. Um, we also do things like color vision, stereopsis, which is depth perception. So we gather a, a lot of data that tells us about their overall eye health and their posture visually in terms of how they're doing for health. Then once they get in the chair, then we're beginning to do an extensive case history. Our exams are 80 minutes. So we may even do 15, 20 minutes just of case history. And in doing so, we're sorting them, headache, dizziness, nausea. We're starting to get the baseline data. Then we use a hallway that's four foot wide, 30 foot long. And we ask them to walk down that hallway as if they're about to meet a friend. They walk down and come back and we're observing, did they drift to the right? Did they drift to the left? Did they show a serpentine gait? Did they move their right hand only and not their left as much? Did they tilt when they walk? So all this information we're gathering visually. And then at the very end of the visit, after treatment, we do the same walk. How is their gait now? Have they established wider, longer stances? Are they doing less shuffling and so on. So we're always gathering what I'll describe as before and after data. Once they do that first walk, uh, in our work now, we're assessing sound. And we learned that through a patient about six years ago. She was a traditional head injury patient I'd taken care of for many years. But this time she came with headphones on. And I asked her about those headphones. And I said, tell me about those. And she said, well, they're sound canceling. You have to write down the brand. 
has to be this brand. And so I said, okay, what's the name? And they, they were a special noise canceling design. And she said, I can't be without them. So in the back of my mind, I thought, well, that's interesting, but what will I do with this information? And I later found out that same company made a smaller version, thought I would get those. And I began using those and discovering that about a half to three quarters of my head injury patients, not only had eye misalignment, but there was an inner ear piece to their puzzle. And by using these noise canceling devices, I would do that walk that I just described to you without putting them on first. And then I would put the noise canceling headphones on and their walk changed. So that meant that sound was influencing their gait. And that was the beginning of exploring how influencing is this sound in their overall condition and how I use that information. By the end of the exam, sometimes they didn't need the device. Other times they couldn't be without it. So it's a whole nother new category that we use every day in our neurovisual exam. Then I do the testing, check each eye separately, do everything we need to do. And then we do something called trial framing. So I'll put a frame on them with the new prescription that I've identified. And I do something called prism challenge. I've gathered enough data to tell me with their tilt, with their measurements, where do I need to begin if I need to apply prism. As I do that prism application, the letters on the sign get clearer, and then we move and walk in those glasses. As I mentioned, now it's their after. Now, how do they walk with the prism in place? So I always have to prove to myself and to the patient that the lenses I'm applying are making a difference real time, and that will drive the final prescription. So just to add on to that slightly, what she's basically doing is custom fitting a visual orthotic device if you will. That's the first thing. And the second thing is because of the nature of this particular condition, feedback is provided by the patient immediately. That is, if noise is an issue, and I'll be happy to go into the physiology with you later, if noise is an issue, by taking noise out of the picture, you should experience an improvement now. If you have a misalignment problem and you're struggling hard not to see double, if we can use PRISM, to realign your images, that struggling should stop right away. Your symptoms should stop now. So as a rule, on the first visit, if this is what the problem is, um, if it's visually related, they'll experience about a 50% reduction of their incoming symptoms that day now, which is very impressive. And it also seals the diagnosis because pretty much nothing else does that. And they often want to go home with my crazy frame. Oh, yeah. You know that they've been helped because my frame is quite heavy. It's not intended for home use, but they don't want to take it off. So that's a, a pretty good indicator. They've been comforted by, and we look at our severity index. What's your dizzy now when you're wearing this? What's your headache now? And we're looking to see what layers have we peeled off. Sometimes the neck pain didn't get better because guess what? There's something very different going on with the neck. They may have bulging discs from their head injury, but we at least can peel off the layers that we know we can touch, and then we know where to send them next. So when we're thinking about intervention approaches, one, of course, is prisms, and you test and retest that right in your office before prescription. What else are you thinking about in terms of intervention? So sound, as we mentioned, is there a deep inner ear structural issue? And we will, if they come back, we always come back one month later. So when they come back and maybe they've decided to utilize a noise canceling device, if they tell me they can't be without it now because their whole body feels better and the glasses help it, they need the combination. I then will send them out to an otologist for deep inner ear structure evaluation to look, is there something going on with that inner ear? So that's one element. Sometimes they have something called dysautonomia or POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Those are the patients that tell you they can't stand up for very long without feeling like they're going to pass out. They're patients that uh, feel their heart beating hard. Uh, oftentimes, I'll actually examine those patients reclined. I elevate their feet. I recline their body. And it takes the load off of that gravity pull that makes them feel dizzy from lack of blood flow to the brain. So we do look at dysautonomia. So we're always 
peeling off layers that seem to me to be contributory to their symptoms. MAV too. Migraine associated vertigo. Mm -hmm. So they come back at one month and they say, you know what, this feels great and this feels great, but you know, those headaches are still there. And especially when I drink coffee, especially when I drink red wine, especially when I have certain foods that make me feel worse. So we're now identifying the migraineur. And then we identify a special diet. We talk to them about information that we've learned, give them a packet on that. So we're looking at the migraine connection as it will, as you will with food connections. So what's nice is when we've been able to isolate out the visual component, um, these other things now become more apparent. You know, if you, when you've got more variables, it's just hard to solve for the equation. So by getting this huge variable out of the way, the remaining stuff all of a sudden kind of starts to fit into patterns that you would recognize. I love the term that you use with layers because we have said this over and over again. It's very rare that a patient comes in with one issue. It usually is a multifactorial issue and peeling away those layers and getting to the root cause of their symptoms as well as taking away some of the symptoms that have kind of stacked on top is the way to treat the patient. And your holistic approach to your evaluation, I think, is um, absolutely amazing. I love that you look at gait. I love that you look at the um, effect of what you're doing right in the office because you're going to see results, you know, if you apply a prism or put on noise canceling um, headphones. And I, I absolutely love that. Um, you had shared a video with us. If you want to just, if, if it's okay if I pop it up. Um, this is, yeah, this is... Um, an eight-year-old, which I thought was amazing. You, this was kind of the hallway that you talked about where the uh, child, he's going to walk without prisms and, and then um, with the prisms. So uh, I have it muted. So you'll be able to talk over it if you would like to narrate what's going on here. Maybe. Come on. Let's see. Here. Nope. Wrong one. Hold on. There we go. All right. So we have a little eight-year-old. Yep, and he was asked to walk down the hallway without and then with corrective glasses. He's a young man who could not ride a bike, struggled to read, was diagnosed with ADHD and dyslexia. And this was his first time showing his gait initially. And here he is. You can see how he just sort of moves side to side, almost with all of his body trying to stay upright and stable. And then with the glasses on, just moments later, after all the assessment, of course, now he doesn't have that side to side pull. He can navigate the hallway in a centered position and be more sure footed. He's now actually able to ride his bike for hours. He loves to read and the ADHD and dyslexia are being reassessed. And uh, when it said he's excited about life, this is a young man who had so much anxiety. He didn't want to go to school anymore. And he was such a cute little guy and was so engaging and yet that school setting was so anxiety provoking because he couldn't perform. He couldn't do what he was being asked to do. Um, so I think the critical nature is while you might listen to all these symptoms and anxiety might be the driving force, in the end, if he filled out that questionnaire, he was high in almost every symptom. So he did beautifully and he's doing well now. So that's, that's the example of a young child struggling in school. And just to ask you guys, you saw his gait. He had been seen by other specialists before he came to Debbie. They didn't know what that was. I mean, did that gait look like any kind of clear or obvious pattern to you? Mm -mm. No, I probably would have classified that more uh, typical of a, what we'd call like an aphysiological gait. Uh, it didn't quite make sense as to why he was moving wider base of support, clearly having some issues with spatial orientation. But looking at that, you know, it... it it would have been a little bit more puzzling to me without bringing in the visual component to that. So I, I think that was really interesting to see. And you, you had sent a couple other videos too that were just as kind of miraculous to watch. Um, it's amazing to think about how much just addressing vision can affect that patient. And, you know, I think back to working with patients for vestibular dysfunction, that yes, there is a clear vestibular dysfunction there and we help them to a certain point but they continue to struggle with some of the gait and head turn activities and spatial awareness activities. That's making me think back more now to having this binocular visual dysfunction and how that could have maybe helped them um, off that plateau or over that next little hump. 
Um, so I, I think that's really important to see that you can make a, such a quick adjustment just by addressing the visual field. And, you know, one of the saddest things with this patient cohort is pretty much every one of them at some point has been told that they're nuts, that they're malingering, that they're secondary gain, you're making it up. Why are you doing this? And they feel very discounted and abused not frankly, believed. by the system. It's just, they feel awful and they're not making it up and we're able to prove that. So, yeah. There's so much overlap for what we see in the clinic, what we hear in the clinic and what you guys are, are doing and seeing as well. And you're absolutely right. This patient population feels very isolated, misheard, uh, misdiagnosed, misrepresented. And it's amazing how, you know, getting them to the right person to help them it makes all the difference. Um, which is absolutely huge. Um, Abby, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, so we we spoke a little bit about if we find um, a certain score on the questionnaire, if we do some of the tests or we see the gait, um, the five-minute cover test or the abnormal near-point convergence or discomfort with that test, what other things should we look for? Or when do we know we should be referring to someone like you. So the BBDQ, which is our questionnaire, anytime they score 15 or higher. Um, in terms of the NPC or NPD, when you have them do that and they get nauseous and dizzy, that shouldn't happen. So some things are just slam dunks right away, easy. Five minute cover test, oh, I feel so good. That's easy. So when you see the preponderance of data coming in says, you know what, they're a candidate for care. Um, if they say to, I just had an eye exam, what you're learning today is it may be a different exam. So um, I couldn't do it in 15 minutes. I can't say hello to someone in 15 minutes. So you need to have that extensive 80 minute assessment that'll really fly spec and sort out all the binocular vision characteristics of this population. So I would say just being a, being a good listener and learning about this work is the important part. Uh, new information to share. And I would say having a BBDQ in your clinic, uh, a lot of us love intake questionnaires anyhow. I do it for my dysautonomia. I do it for other things to know, am I on the right track with this other thought? I would encourage you to have your patients coming in or clients just fill out a BBDQ before you even begin your work with them. And then you'll know there may be an element of vision to this patient's care. Just to add on to that, if you're not getting the results, you've evaluated this patient. You're pretty sure you know what's going on. You're going ahead. You provide the treatment that should be effective. And you're getting stuck or you've plateaued or they're just not progressing like you think they should. You know, that always makes clinicians take a step back and go, okay, what else is going on? Something else must be going on here that would be a perfect opportunity to add this into the mix. Alternatively, you could do it right in the beginning um, and see if that this is really part of the mix for why they were sent to you in the first place. Because if it is, your effectiveness is diminished if this is a problem that's concurrent. Once you get rid of this, you're, you stand a chance of being way more effective with your therapies um, when the visual component is off the table. Yeah, those are all really good points. And I will definitely be including this in some, I can think of some patients right now where you just kind of feel stuck or they made great progress initially, and then there's still some sort of lingering component to their care that's missing. So thank you so much for the resources and the knowledge that you guys have provided today. I'm sure many of our clinicians will feel the same listening to this. You're welcome. And I will share with you, I have a physical therapy, vestibular therapist colleague of mine, who she actually came for care. She got better. She was a soccer player, a lot of head injuries with heading the ball. She was a very positive responder to this noise canceling device. She ended up beginning to utilize it in her noisy clinic. And as she did, she actually peeled away that uh, level of sound that was triggering their vestibular symptoms and helped her sort them with the inner ear piece. So just to share that with you, if your space is noisy and your patients aren't progressing, it's just another layer that you can sort of assess for hyperacusis as it relates to too much sound getting into a system with somebody who may have had a head injury. Is that primarily with head injury that you see hyperacusis or is there other type of patients that we'd see that with? 
Well, there are certainly congenital cases where I might have a young child who's never liked loud sounds. And then the mom's sitting there saying, oh, me neither. Oh, and my dad, his grandfather, same thing. So you can have people born with a thin canal bone where they just are hearing sounds too loudly and they don't have a way to protect themselves. So there can be the congenital version. Probably because I see so many head injuries, it represents over 50% of our patients that I have this opportunity to listen differently to them. And one of our trackable numbers is on a scale of zero to 10, how bothered are you by sounds? If you can ask that simple question, zero to 10, if they tell you five or greater, start listening to whether or not that may be a piece of the puzzle. You know, they don't like when somebody puts dishes away in the cupboard. They startle with a dog barking. So listen for the input that can help a lot to know if there's an earpiece. And just to talk about that further, there's this condition called superior semicircular canal dehiscence. Pretty much whether they have that or not, this is the same symptom set. So if you want to just look that up, you'll be able to see the symptoms that we're discovering. It turns out it's not the superior canal only that can have the dehiscence, um, but uh, the symptom set and how people react, it's it's very similar. So using that, that's what we're seeing. And that's why the noise canceling helps. It's a third window of sorts. Mm -hmm. Um, Either that or the oval and round windows have a leak. And that all gives the same symptom set. And they can have eye and ear. So we're always looking both back and forth, back and forth. How much is eyes? How much is ears? And sometimes a patient can say, wow, I think it's 50-50. And they can almost come out and say, nope, it's 80% ears or it's 80% eyes. And as I take off the sound canceling device, they actually can see letters move, put them on and they go, oh my goodness, they're still they're not moving. So uh, you're in school, you may have learned about the Tulio's phenomena. Tulio was the bench scientist who used to put tiny holes in the canal bones of pigeons mm-hmm. and that the pigeons couldn't walk straight. And the pigeon's eyes showed nystagmus. With sound. With sound introduction. So by taking away the sound, it's like reverse Tulio's and they can actually walk down my hallway straighter and more confidently. So sound, one patient said, was pushing him around. And when I got rid of it, he knew where he was in space. So just an element of interest to pursue. And that's when you would refer out to an otologist to have them look at that and explore further. Yes. That's really interesting. Now, um, is there, uh, we'll include it in the show notes, but there's there's a link where we can look up specialists that have been trained within your program, right? You said there's about 30 around the country. So if we need to go out, we can we can follow that link and we can get people help that they need. Um, if we have them fill out the questionnaire and we notice that they have some issues with the um, additional tests, including the point of um, discomfort and the five minute cover test, uh, which I think is really great. And is there a way for pe- for um, people to get trained so that we can add to this number of of providers out there? I would love for you to share information about our training program because. There are 30,000 optometrists in the country and we've only trained 30. So we have a lot more work to do. And I, I would love for there to be somewhere in every state, if not multiples in some of the bigger states. So yes, uh, what would be, Mark, the best uh, connection for them to find out? So we have a website, nvminstitute.org and you'll include that in the notes. Yes. Um, but that's Neurovisual Medicine Institute. So that's the website connection for our training program. Um, There are other doctors that do work with patients in a somewhat similar manner. They'll do vision therapy, they'll use prism lenses, but our approach is definitely different from that and it's unique. So, you know, the 30 people we've trained pretty much are doing what we've trained them to do. Um, And it's important to get your, your patient hooked up with somebody that's had that special training. Well, especially because you you seem to align with so much of what we preach here of listening to the patient, spending time with the patient, taking a holistic approach and looking at the patient as a whole and not just the one subset of a specialty that you focus on. So I think that knowing that makes me feel so great about finding someone who's been through your program or finding a neurovision specialist that practices similar, similarly just because I know the patient's going to get a, a 
fresh set of eyes with a holistic approach, which I think is amazing. Absolutely amazing. Uh, is and there any? Oh, go ahead. I, I just was just going to say when I teach my colleagues the very first day, one of the things I say to them is I want to teach you how to become a headache sorter and a dizzy sorter. Because we never thought about those things when we were in optometry school. Again, it was all clear, near, far. But when you learn that there can be things that can trigger the symptoms, that's when you open up your ears to listen differently. Uh, a, a great example came when a patient was coming for care and we kept trying to adjust her lenses and we weren't hitting the mark and we just kept searching for the answer. And she came in one day and she said, boy, I finally got better. And I said, okay, tell me, I need to know. So I'll know the next time. Turns out she had a tooth infection. And when they finally, because it was a root canal and the nerve was dead, it was only when they removed or something related to that, removed they removed the tooth and there was all this pus. And when they cleaned it out within 48 hours, and if you think about the trigeminal nerve and this whole area, she kept saying my right ear, my right ear, and it was the right side. Once that infection got removed, all of her symptoms went away. Now, she still needed a tiny bit of prism, but the important lesson for me was that think about the teeth. So it just goes to that you know, complexity of this population, no stone left unturned. Um, another patient, unique case, is a young man who had uh, was in Kentucky, and he got some kind of bite. And his symptoms all started after that bite. And he didn't light up the questionnaire, but he had enough symptoms. He found our website and turns out he had Lyme's disease. Mm -hmm. So another element where we have to just be thinking about when did it start? What happened? And what do we need to investigate? So he got sent off to a doctor who can investigate the Lyme's and, and he's better now. So those are kind of things you just have to think broadly and then specifically, of course, with our work. And then one last comment about medications. So as you know, as therapists, they can complicate everything. And there's a bunch of medications that are vestibular suppressants or function that way, you know, benzodiazepines, narcotics, true vestibular suppressants, et cetera. And a lot of our patients have been put on those kinds of medications by their traditional doctors and specialists because that's what they know how to do to help this person. And what they frequently are doing is masking some of the symptoms, but they're not really getting to the root cause of the problem and resolving it. So when we are able to get a hold of those folks and help them, first of all, uh, we can help them not quite as much as we can help the traditional patient because these medications are interfering with the alignment mechanism. You know, everything's a little bit loose, if you will, or sloppy. Uh, but once we work with them, we can usually get them to discontinue some of those medications. It's done with in, in conjunction with their, their doctor, but as they get more better, then they don't need the headache medicine. So they start reducing the headache medicine. And then we're able to tighten up their vision prescription, which makes them more better. And you continue, it's a cycle of reductions of medications. That's really cool. Cause I can't think of too many instances where these kinds of medications can ever be discontinued. And yet we've had a number of patients do exactly that. That's amazing and a really good point. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for joining our show today. You provided so much knowledge for not only clinicians, but also patients and a questionnaire that people can really help themselves with and see if this is a route they should be looking for in their future. Any last comments or tidbits for our audience before we let you go? No, we're honored to and just want to thank you for allowing us to share our work. We always feel like it's a bad secret that we don't want to keep quiet. We want to share. So thank you for letting us share. We're really grateful for this chance. Thanks. Thank you, guys. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. All righty. Bye-bye now. If you're interested in finding us on social media or the web, you can visit www.vestibular.today for more resources, including testing, treatment, and educational videos blogs, continuing education classes, and resources including clinic equipment recommendations, suggested tests, and BPBB treatment charts. Search Vestibular Today and Balancing Neck Rehab on all social media platforms, including Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. 
Also, be sure to check out Balancing Act Rehab at www.balancingactrehab.com, especially if you think you would benefit from vestibular therapy. We are your girls. The information on this podcast is not intended to replace the care provided by your qualified health professional or to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on Talk Dizzy to Me. Please contact us at Balancing Act Rehab if you think you could benefit from vestibular therapy.